Hi guys, so today we're going to look at under the hood of web bundlers. It's a bit of a black box for most developers. Tools like uh, Create React App and uh, uh, Babel, they all kind of abstract these things away and hide them. Uh, and this came from some research I did into Webpack and actually I found some interesting things and we're going to uh, be taking a look at them today. So first off, a little bit about me. I'm a software engineer at Nested. Um, we help you sell your property chain free. I'm a member of the Mocha Core team. I'm a big football fan, uh, mainly QPR. And you can catch you can catch me on Twitter and GitHub at Craig Torb. And my medium handle is Taboo Craig. And I, I like to blog a lot, so catch me on there. So the plan today: what is a web bundler? Uh, building a compiler for a web bundler. And this is actually going to be a simplification of how Webpack works under the hood. There are lots of different ways to solve this, so we're going to look at one today. And then using the output with an application. So, uh, why bundle in the first place? For performance reasons, uh, third-party code is expensive. You want to optimize. You can use, we can, we, we can optimize what is shipped via static code analysis, you know, cherry-picking and tree-shaking, save a lot of of uh, resources required. Uh, we can turn 100 files into one so you can really simplify what is actually shipped, what the user downloads. And there's there's an argument that HTTP2 is making devices more capable of requesting dozens of files at once, but it's still expensive and it takes a toll on the user's time and the data usage. There's support. So the web has so many environments and you want to make sure that your code can run in as many of them as possible and uh, bundlers can come with some polyfill management, which is very useful. The user experience, you know, with uh, web bundlers you can introduce all sorts of intelligence like uh, browser caching with separate bundles, we can have an application bundle, a vendor bundle, uh, you can use that kind of level of, of separating concerns. Uh, and also on that note, uh, you can also, we can also separate the fonts and the stylings and the images uh, all, all separate to our JavaScript. So there's many reasons why in 2020 you'd still want to use a web bundler. So a basic architecture of a web bundler is has always kind of remained the same. A load of modules written through your compiler builds assets out the other side. So before we start, a couple of items that are actually involved within a web bundler. Um, th there's quite a few of them, and I think it's a thing which makes this quite an interesting topic in my opinion because there's there are a lot of things going on in a very short amount of space. Uh, we have an iffy, an immediately invoked function expression. We're using some pass by reference. There's dependency graphs going on. Uh, we're defining our own custom import and export system, which is very interesting. Uh, there's some recursive functions, uh, some AST passing and generation. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, AST is a abstract syntax tree. It's turning source code into its tokenized form. So we're going from code to an array of objects, uh, and that can be processed in many different ways. Uh, we're going to be using hashing, and we're going to be using the native ESM module, so native ECMAScript modules for this. The uh, main reason is because it has very good cyclic dependency support, because um, it does all these compile time checks, which you don't get from uh, earlier modules, mod uh, module versions of Node. Uh, one thing to note, we will be ignoring non-JavaScript, CSS, and images. Um, so it, this is just going to be looking at JavaScript. So the compiler overview, a uh, couple of simple parts to it, and a uh, couple of simple, part, simple parts that make that we're going to be making use of today. Um, and I've tried to kind of stick to how Webpack does it. So uh, we've got traversing the dependency graph, then we're going to be converting the tree into a JavaScript application bundle. Uh, so we start with number one with an empty file and produce the dependency array after converting our tree into a JavaScript application bundle we then uh, we take in this dependency array and we spit out a bundle string and then the final part is helping our application make use of this bundle so we're going to take this bundle file and uh, we're going to sorry we're going to spit out the bundle file and also spit out a uh, JSON manifest file so our application can make use of that so starting point of our application um, this is a very basic application which, which logs the date. It's a, got a very basic file structure. Uh, we're going to come back to the file structure shortly. So we can see that we call uh, we, we call return date time 
whose job is just to return the date time, the current date time. We then take this date time and pass it into a logger function. And the log date function's job is to log whatever it's given with some additional text. Passes this into a logger whose job is just a console log. It's a very, very simple application here. So here's our application tree as it stands. File A was calling file B and file C and file C was importing file D. You can see if we look back here, file A is importing file B, file C, file B, nothing imported, file C, importing file D, and file D, nothing imported. So back to our, our application tree, we've got this here. So step number one, we want to traverse our dependency graph. So we're going to be taking in an entry file and we want to produce this dependency array. So uh, we're going to be keeping a single dependency array, which is outside of our recursive tree. So we're going to be, first of all, within our function, we pass it a file. Uh, we resolve the whole file. It's much more, use, it's, it's, it's critical that we always convert the file into the full path so we can be sure whether it's, we're coming across the same file again or not. Um, so the first thing we do is check if our array already has that file. And if it does, we return. We don't need to process its dependencies. Um, we then grab the file contents and we store the path and the path source as this module object. We're actually using a third party tool for this AST parsing. Um, and you can see where we're converting the code into the AST. And then the final thing we do here is we process the dependencies within each module. So it's that import declaration a node type, that, that AST node type. And then for any given import declaration, it then hands the, the value, uh, so this will be the file, uh, recursively back into itself. And then at the end of this, we're going to add the, the module back to the dependency array. And because we're doing this as, at, at the end, this means that we're going from a depth, depth up. So um, what we end up with is an array, something like this on the right side. So we start with file B, and we have file D, and then C, and then A. So it's kind of going, it, it builds itself back up. Um, and this is our, this, and it's got the, the name and the AST stored with it. As we can see back here, we're storing the source of each file with the name of the file. So that's our array as it is right now. It's uh, four items in this array. So done with step one. Step two, converting the tree into a JavaScript application bundle. So we want to take this dependency array and we want to produce this bundle string. Uh, this is actually where most of the functionality comes into it. So uh, the first thing to look at is actually the compiler's job. So we're going to be executing code which will produce executable code. So we want to be very clear that there are two different steps and we're going to be looking at them individually. Let's not get too bogged down with everything at once. So we're going to first review what the compiler builds and then we're going to review the built code which is then run by the browser itself. So there are a few parts to number one. So the first part is uh, we're going to be looking at these uh, templates. It's a simplified version of the Wempack templates. Uh, it's, we've got a template for the modules, which includes an import and an export. Oh, modules and an import and an export runtime. Um, so we're going to review what actually happens at runtime later on. Uh, although I will say that we want the code to be compatible in as many environments as possible. Um, and E6 modules support the strict mode natively, but ES5 modules don't. So we are explicitly setting, defining strict mode in our templates. So as you can see on the left, We've got our module template string, where we just take the module code, put this into a wrapper function, uh, and also to the index. And um, that's actually something that Webpack does as well, stores the index with uh, each module. And interestingly, uh, in Node.js, in all ECMAScript modules, the official ESM spec, they are internally wrapped in function, which is attaching runtime details, so exports and whatnot. So here we are doing a very similar thing and actually Webpack does this as well. If you look in the source code of, of what Webpack has produced, you'll see all of the modules wrapped in this uh, wrapper function. And then on the right, we've got our, our runtime template. Um, we've got all of the modules uh, hand passed in at the bottom and uh, an ID of the index. And this is important because this is a starting module. Uh, and this is that it will all make a lot more sense later. The important thing to note is that we've got template building modules and a template for our runtime. The next step is the import and exports. Um, on the left, uh, we have defining a function which takes in an ESM import, 
uh, and it's going to replace it with our version of an import, our custom import. Uh, and the same with the export on the right. Um, we take in an item and we return a new export statement. And you can see at the bottom on the uh, import, we can see uh, on line three of our import what this is actually going to produce. You can see the const import equals r require. So that's what we're going to be producing with our with the ID of the file put in there. Sorry, the ID of its uh, in the array, its index in the array put in there, the dependencies index in the array. Sorry. And then the export, uh, we do something very similar. You can see the bottom line of the comment. We're going to be uh, producing the module.exports with the function name that the module has. Uh, so a couple of notes on uh, on uh, web Webpack. Um, it de it stores the dependency IDs on the modules early, so it's got its own dependency template, which actually replaces the imports and the export usage with this custom variable. Um, so mine here just swaps the import itself. Uh, there swaps the entire line and and all the uses of it, usage of it. So um, that's that's just one area of many things that aren't quite the same. So it's it's we capture a lot of the functionality that what Webpack is doing. Um, but it does it much more in depth. So the final part of this is actually um, transforming the array into the string. So we're going to actually process this dependency array now. So uh, we're going to iterate through each of the dependents, um, grab the AST, uh, replace the module, replace, sorry, grab the source, uh, replace the import with our import. You can see uh, the item equals get import, We've, and also any exports replace the export with our export, so you can see the get export. And then we've updated the, the AST of the source for that dependency. Um, and now we're going to be generating the template string. And then we're going to be adding this to a, a dependency, building a new array with our module template string, so a whole new array with all of our module templates. And then right at the very end there, we add all our modules um, to this runtime, to the runtime template string, um, and also grab the uh, last item in the array, which we, you can see that depth array dot length minus one. We know that the last item in the array will be the last thing, the, the first thing that called because of how our initial code, we go all the way back, because of how our, sorry, at the bottom there, adding the module to the dependency array right at the end. So it's going to recur, it ensures the last one is called, the first one is called at the end. So uh, we know that it's our last item in the array, that is our starting point of the application. So that is everything that the, com the compiler has, has, has called. The final thing is now what the compiler produces. So it builds this, uh, the, the content of a bundle for the browser. Uh, and, and calling this, the app, is like calling no node at start time. Uh, and then the app itself calls the, triggers the runtime. So we can see here on the left, we've got our runtime template, which is our iffy, which runs immediately, calling the imports and uh, setting an exports function. Uh, which is itself actually triggered by calling an index, um, and then the app runs, executing the exports function. So we can see we've got our, we start with the installed, and I'll just read through the code, defining our runtime, we've, we've got an installed modules, which is a cache, um, we've defined our, our require function, which is our import functionality, uh, we'll come back to that in a minute, we've now built our module, and we're storing the exports against this, and the reason we're doing, we're adding an export here is because it's going to be using a pass by reference functionality. So we execute our module in the next line and we hand it the module because we're aware that if you look on the right hand side, uh, what's actually going on with the module.exports, it's using our um, reference for that module. So now our return date time, as you can see on line 45 on the right, is actually going to be handed to the exports object on line 15 on the left. So it's using a pass by reference. Uh, and then the final thing we do is we then cache that module. So now we build up this cache of all the modules, their runtimes have been executed, uh, and not their actual not the actual function, just the runtime, just the wrapper has. The functions with them hasn't been run yet. And the thing that calls that actually triggers it is on line 33 on the left. We can see that we're calling our require with index three, which is the if we go back, we can see it's the it's the last item in our array in uh, depths array dot length minus one, uh, which is going to execute the actual starting point of the application. Uh, so that is the output. Of, so so the, the summary of that is that we've now defined our uh, start time, we've called, we've called it from a runtime, so, and we've got an import and an export, a custom import and an exports 
system uh, working. So the final step now is uh, helping our application make use of this bundle. Uh, so we want to produce a bundle file and we want to produce our JSON manifest file. So uh, we're going to create a hash. We're then going to write the contents of uh, our vendor string that we produced previously, the output. Uh, we want to hash those contents. And then, uh, sorry, uh, yes, uh, we want to build a hash of those contents and that'll be our file name. And then we want to put the contents of our vendor into the file. So now we've got a bundle with a hash ID uh, file name and the, the contents will be our whole output string that we saw previously. Uh, this, this is the output. Uh, and the last thing we want to do is build a manifest file so we can tell the application which, uh, where our bundle is located and, and we put the file name, the bundle and its hash in there as well. Uh, so then it comes to our application itself. How does our application actually make use of this bundle? So we've got a very simple express application here. Uh, it just imports our manifest JSON file and adds a bundle to the static, calls it from a static location and we can see we've uh, exported our exp we are defining our build folder as a static uh, accessible route, um, and then we are returning our, our HTML string. So the final thing that happens is we now run in the browser, we would run npm run build, which would build our manifest, build our vendor file, um, and then npm run start to run this small webpack application. And we can see here in the middle that um, it's running, we've got our, our vendor file, uh, we've got it console login, what it, so it ran the application itself, and we can see the hash in the name. So, I know that was a lot to take in, so just before we finish, a couple of things which Webpack does as well, to me, which uh, this does not, because um, there's obviously a lot of differences. This is one of the interesting things with this exercise. Um, Webpack, can, uh, so we have only focused on JavaScript application, JavaScript assets, sorry, so there's no CSS images or fonts. Um, is a Webpack comes with a dev and hot module re uh, reloading. It comes built into Webpack, very useful for when you're developing. Um, you can build chunks with a Webpack. So it can it can put different models, modules into different chunks and each can have a slightly different runtime and, and different polyfills and different cache times. So it's very clever with that. Uh, you can use multiple exports, ours cannot. However, uh, it's relatively, it could be relatively easily done with this application. We could just defensively check for an object on the export, and uh, if it is, then it's named, else we could fall back to a default function. Uh, but for this proof of concept, it wasn't really worth that kind of effort. Um, we could have done further, Webpack has lots of optimizations out of the box, minification, code splitting, cherry picking, tree shaking, all the, all the buzzwords. Um, source maps. So Webpack uses a mixture of different pre-processes. Uh, Babel and all sorts of uh, min, min, uglify JS. You can use any kind of anything at the same time, and Webpack will um, merge them, manage merging these different source maps together and producing a single one for you, which is very useful. Um, Webpack is about eighty percent plugins, even internally. Uh, the compiler fires hooks on the lifecycle events, um, so it's on, on like the preprocess file event, for instance. Uh, so that's where most of the code actually ends up living. Um, we, we could extend this, uh, and sorry, the loaders as well, there are loaders, uh, they uh, run before passing a module, so they can do lots of extra things, and this is where kind of Babel would, will come in. We could extend ours to add lifecycle events, um, we could use like the Node.js event emitter, so that people can hook into a lifecycle event, we can have a start, a process file, an end, uh, something that Webpack has, very useful, uh, but again, it's proof of concept. Um, and that's it. That, that's some of the many things that Webpack actually does that ours doesn't. So I hope this has been useful. Uh, I certainly found it a very interesting exercise. And if you like it, please leave a like. Thanks very much.